Great, so great session on this disease that's still under the radar for a lot of people. I think that's why we had the idea of, to bring this session to UC Berkeley. You know, once you know about it, it's kind of shocking how, how, how much already has been affected and how little we hear about it in the news and everywhere. So, questions? This is for Gita. Uh, I'm in the animal world, so uh, there was a scientist at Washington State in the 80s, Bud Ryan, who talked about uh, plants producing enzymes that paralyze the gut of the insect. Is there any attempt to, to make transgenic plants that would be unpleasant to the insects? that scientists are trying to um, target the insect. So there are some, um, uh, some approaches that would include maybe having um, some type of an anti-peptide uh, that would uh, then be detrimental to the insect that could be acquired during feeding. And that would not necessarily have to... Oh, sorry. And that would ne not necessarily have to be... Um, uh, achieved through making a transgenic citrus plant that would be uh, uh, for human consumption. So the idea would then be to have plants that are around the grove, um, around the border of the citrus grove, that could be transgenic and trap the insects. Um, there's also been a push to, for the new psyllid, um, maybe for gene drive in the psyllid, um, or also using viruses um, for psyllid um, uh, uh, control. So, so the, the approach of small molecules that would inhibit and kill the bacteria still seems like it suffers from the same problem of getting the antibiotic to the right spot, right? Is there a way to actually introduce small molecules into the phloem? Well, it's, that's where it seems like it would have to be, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a huge problem. And I know people who have tried different things with antibiotics or, you know, plant immune system promoting compounds and stuff. Sometimes you can add things, maybe that makes the, yeah, because citrus has a very thick waxy cuticle on the leaf. I mean, it's, you know, so it's trying to make that more permeable so things can get in. Um, antibiotics, they actually, it works best to inject them into the trunk so they go into the phloem, into the vasculature, but I mean, that's not very feasible. So yeah, that is a big, that is a big problem. I mean, it's one of the things that makes citrus really difficult, right? If this was a little bean plant or even corn or something, it would be a lot easier. Although if it's, I mean, if it has a big, you know, trunk, right, you can just like shoot it in with a gun or something like that, you know? Yeah. I would also say that, you know, it's the, the pathogen is within these specialized cells in the phloem, right? Yeah. And so, um, just doing a trunk injection, maybe you get some of it to go actually into the sieve elements in the phloem, but most of it is not going to go into the sieve elements into the in the phloem. So um, there's researchers that are working on better delivery mechanisms um, instead of just not just sticking a needle into the trunk, but having mini micro needles or delivery vehicles that might specifically target the phloem, uh, maybe based on some chemical properties there. I'm, I'm curious too about the genetic approach, and I, I like the idea of you know putting in a bunch of like our genes or whatever <laughs> into the. But I wonder too with, and I wasn't quite sure on that that spectrum where you had ones that were resistant and like didn't get infected at all. Whether those are compatible with the Valencia oranges, but um, if, if you if you do mate them, are, are the F ones resistant? And do they make like delicious fruit? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, some of the citrus, most of the citrus genotypes that are, or citrus relatives that are truly immune are not sexually compatible with cultivated citrus. There's one Aramo lemon that appears to be, um, it's not completely immune to the disease, um, but is very promising, and that is sexually compatible with citrus. Uh, the F1 is not particularly tasty, um, but uh, citrus breeders at UC Riverside and elsewhere have been working for a long time to get advanced um, uh, breeding lines for that. Um, and so they're getting closer, I think, and closer. Um, citrus also is, needs to be highly heterozygous or it will suffer uh, severe developmental defects. So you can't just make a, 
you know, an F2, F4 population, you continuously need to cross to a variety of other parents um, in order to keep introducing heterozygosity into the system. I was curious about the the mechanism of protease inhibition by the effector, is it, is it like a bind and inactivation, so you need sort of stoichiometric amounts, or does it modify the, the protease? Since I was thinking about the amount that the plant would have to produce in order to inactivate you know, all of the effectors or vice versa. Um, so we've done some binding assays, and it can bind with fairly high affinity. Um, we thought initially that it would just bind in the um, active site um, like the pocket of the active site, um, but it doesn't seem like uh, that it's binding near there, but not actually in the active site. So um, it, it, that's probably how it's, it's inhibiting protease activity. I also think that for other pathogens, it's not just one effector that inhibits these immune-related proteases, so there's probably a variety of mechanisms that would collectively target them. Yes. Great talk, both of you. Um, first question is for Gita. Uh, for those MAMPs and PAMPs, um, do you have to have the corresponding receptor-like kinases to be able to have this priming activity? So um, well, we, we only have data for one um, receptor-like kinase in citrus, and that's still pretty early stages to, to say it's truly the receptor. Um, so I don't think we can say that yet. But um, if we treat with MAMPs or PAMPs on sweet orange and we don't see a, a immune response, it doesn't have any priming activity. So you have to pick something that um, will elicit defense in order to have priming activity. And have you tried to just uh, apply the, uh, the peptides, like those uh, PAMPs, directly to the uh, such as leaves, such as trees, to see if they can have any? Uh, so we have done that. Um, we've done that. So lemon has a much better perception than sweet orange, and so we've done that in lemon, and the, um, that can elicit defense. Uh, we need to really do many, I think, more replicated experiments to see how that influences disease um, and disease severity and development. Um, sweet orange... Um, unfortunately, does not perceive as many features as uh, most of the other genotypes, and that's what we're most interested in, in growing and eating um, in the United States. But we do have a few that can be perceived, and so we're testing those as well. Great, thanks. And then my second question is for Melanie. Um, great talk. I'm just wondering, uh, the, the, the chemicals you found, are they uh, hydrophobic or uh, like a... What's the characteristic feature of those it, chemicals? It really was a diverse group. The only trend we noticed was that for the vis nr compounds, a lot of them tended to be sulfone types. So I don't know if, you know, the sulfone groups, sulfone groups tend to be a little reactive. I'm, I'm not sure about that. The one that worked the best, of course, it didn't have a sulfone group, but... Um, you know, that, that was really the only thing that popped out. Um, and I will say just, you know, full disclosure, we did have our list of compounds, you know, actually not the list because most of these don't have names. It's basically, you know, we show the structure to the guy who's the head of the um, natural products, you know, department at um, Stanford. And he said, actually, oh, most of these look really like, not amenable to modification. Like, that's the first thing that they look at is, like, how... That's what they always say, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, every so, single so he screening said complaint. that. Yeah. He said that. He's, the, the one that we actually found for the Vizenar that had the good IC50, he said, well, uh, yeah, this, you could probably modify this, but, oh, it's just really on the big side. <laughs> so, you know, that's another... There are just a lot of issues with trying to find a, a perfect, you know, compound... More questions? 
So I have a question uh, about diagnostics. I mean, one thing that always flabbergasted me about this disease is how hard it is to diagnose. Like if you see it, it could be nitrogen deficiency, right? You don't really know because at the, when, after it's been infected by the vector, the vector is gone, right? And it's, as you said, it's tiny, you can't see. Um, and then slowly your plant dies and you don't know why, right? So it's kind of difficult. I mean, I think that's why it also seems we've had it in California longer than we realized. Right. So, what's the current status on uh, diagnostics? Because it's not even detectable in all leaves, as you said, right? Yeah, Some asymmetric right, it's infection. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone have? Oh, there's a full range of things, right? People carrying mm -hmm. little mini gas chromatographs out into the field. I think they're doing some of that at UC. Someone doing that at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. to detect volatiles? So I, my understanding is that um, the only thing that's going to be accepted by regulatory agencies is a PCR positive, so that you're actually able to use specific primers to detect the pathogen. But there has been a number of, but by then I think the issue is it's kind of a little bit too late. Um, and so then the pathogen is already established. And so there's been a number of approaches to really try to look at early detection technologies. So there's been proteomic early detection technologies, metabolomic early detection technologies, and then also um, I think using um, even their, Johan Laveau's work has shown that there has been changes in the um, microbiome that could be used to, uh, signify that there's likely um, disease uh, or the pathogen might be present. Um, I don't think that any of those are um, accepted as if you have a positive there, then the regulatory agency is going to come in and take right. use the trees. Um, there's also the, I don't know if people have heard about the dogs, um, but the, that seems to be where the industry is maybe most excited. And so their dogs uh, appear to be able to sense the volatiles um, that the tree is emitting. And um, they're using that in Florida, and they're starting to use that in California. Mm -hmm. yes. That's interesting. I saw a demo of the dogs with potted, diseased, and undiseased at the meeting in, meeting in Florida. And they were able to do it. I mean, whether or not they were getting cues or, mm -hmm. you know, what, I don't know. No, that's great because honestly, I'm looking around in the Berkeley area and I, I see a lot of citrus trees, you know, having severe problems. I, I'm wondering if it's HLB or if it's, you know, persistent drought or whatever, but it, mineral, mineral deficiencies mineral yeah, too. That's true. But it's become worse over the last couple of years too, but there's no real good easy diagnostic you could do. I mean, PCR. Though it's not, not really, we, we could do it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you have another diagnostic, you know, the one like the ones Gita mentioned, or even the, the dogs, then you can do PCR surveillance. I mean, I've heard that there are some commercial orchards where dogs have flagged trees and they're monitoring those, you know, consistently. I mean, what's your opinion about, you know, the, the speed and the, the efficacy of the whole response? Because it seems that the, the disease is pretty old, right? It's been spreading relatively slowly globally, but, but it, it still seems like it's taking us by surprise, right? I mean, it's already in California now, everywhere, and now we go like, what can we do? California, I think it's been a lot better because, you know, we had the heads up with Florida, hmm. and we knew we had the ACP. So, I mean, I think we're in a better position, would you agree, yeah, and the than Florida was? Yeah, the environmental conditions are not as severe um, yeah. uh, in California as they would be just to promote diseases in Florida. So Florida is a really um, tropical environment, and so the psyllid can survive and proliferate um, all throughout the year. Uh, Texas has also had the disease. Not it, The first positive was not too far past when the first positive was from Florida. And um, although there are yield losses due to the disease, it's not been as devastating as in Florida. And so it's not really known whether this is differences um, uh, because of the environmental conditions there or a variety or something else. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions?